October 16, 2018. Welcome. Um, we will now close the executive session and reconvene the public meeting. Uh, the purpose of our executive session was to disclose potential pending litigation uh, pursuant to uh, RCW 42.30.11 I, and no action was taken by the commission during that executive session. Uh, we're now going to uh, convene the <clears throat> public meeting, and we'll start with the public uh, comment period. Uh, during this uh, meeting, we will have two comment periods, one at 4.30 and one at 5.30. Um, out of respect for everybody, we'd appreciate if you hold your comments to uh, uh, three minutes if you can. I see that Darren Williams has signed up, and I don't know that I've ever heard him keep a conversation within that three minute period. But joke aside, I'm going to take roll. <laughs> Commissioner Briscoe? Here. Commissioner Bell? Here. Commissioner Shepard? Here. All present and accounted for public comment period. Darren, would you like to start the public comment period? The floor is yours. And we noticed you brought your bodyguards with you, so in case any of us get unruly. Thank you, Commissioner Bell, for the green light. Um, Darren Williams, Whatcom County resident and longshoreman. So I uh, want to talk today about the item, uh, action item, which is related to the contract between the Port and Ports of America. So, you know, usually I'm up here you know, talking about what we could do, what we could do, what we could do. Today, it's definitely what we should do. And I believe we should enter into the contract with Ports of America. Um, as you know, we haven't had work here in a long time. So the longshoremen here in Bellingham have traveled a lot. And we typically travel from Portland everywhere north. Um, Ports of America operates in many of those ports. And I can say confidently, my opinion and Many of these similar opinions have been shared with me. They're a good company to work for. Um, they're consistent. Um, they adhere to the contract. Uh, there's never any monkeying around with them. It's a, always a good operation. And it doesn't matter whether it's in Vancouver or in Tacoma or when, when they were in Seattle. Uh, we've also done our due diligence about Ports of America uh, beyond just working for them as an employee. Uh, we've talked to our side of our grievance procedures. We call it the coast. And they have representation at the coast as, le as well. They're one of the companies that has the fewest amount of issues that ever get to that level. So they're, they're good at resolving issues locally and coming out with mutual uh, resolution. So, you know, I, we've always had reservations about exclusive contracts. And I think we've done a good job, the port staff, has done a good job at negotiating something that's really in the middle. Gives them confidence to pursue work, gives the port some flexibility to pursue other customers. So, you know, there's, there's no loss in this that we can see. It's the progression of getting the terminal back up on, on its feet again, making money for the community, for longshoremen, for all the other suppliers in the county that will uh, benefit from that activity and and the community as a whole through the revenue that's generated for the port because the port needs revenue to pay for all the things that the community would like the port to do and the terminal up and operating will generate that kind of revenue so it's a win-win all the way across the board so it's, it's a good Stephen Earn company um, they'll bring good work they'll produce jobs produce revenue and uh, I think that's what we're all about. That's what I've been talking about for years. So I hear my bell, and I'll try to keep it short. I'd just like to thank this commission and several commissions before that seen the possibility of this happening and, and made the commitment, and to the staff that has really put the boots on the ground and did the work to bring this kind of a agreement to the table. So I hope the commission votes for it, and uh, I look forward to what will happen if you do. Thank you. Thank you for that input, Darren. It's very helpful to the decision we'll make today. Thank you. Um, no one else has signed up. Anybody else wishing to speak? So you guys are all really just muscle. You're not here to say anything, right? <laughs> That's Frank the leg breaker, Freddie the leg breaker, <laughs> Phil the leg breaker. 
<laughs> could, could I add one more thing, real short? Be uh, on behalf of, of the people you see out here, um, I think the majority of them, well, maybe it's a 50-50 split, are what we call casuals or part-time workers. They're the ones that are really going to benefit from this deal. Because if this goes, we will add people, we'll create more full-time jobs. That's why they're here. Uh, maybe not to speak, but to see what you do. So, thanks. Thanks. Well received. I was Anyone casual else? once. Anyone else was? Just <laughs> well, I was. His dad was over there. I was a casual guy once. Not casual anymore. <laughs> okay. Just down. And I have an open mic, so I have to be careful <laughs> <laughs> about what I say. All right. I'm going to close the public comment period, hearing no one else. I'll move on to the consent agenda. Approve consent agenda items A through E. Um, anybody from the commission wish to pull something or discuss? Yeah, there's a request to pull item um, C, I believe. No, I'm sorry, B, B, B. We can just pull that and put it on the regular agenda, so you'll be approving all of the consent agenda with the exception of item B. I don't have any questions for those. I don't have any questions. I don't so with that exception. A motion to accept, or excuse me, approve consent agenda items A through E with the exception of B for a separate vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 So we'll add item B as agenda item seven on your regular agenda. Okay, with that, presentations, is there a joke? Yeah, come on, don't let us down. Budget update. Uh, Good afternoon, Commissioners. Tamara Sobjack, Director of Finance. Um, you are correct. We have budget update as well as a third quarter report. But no joke. Of course I have a joke. What did the green grape say to the purple grape? Breathe. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> okay. Oh, uh, okay. I no. asked for it. <laughs> Why isn't a koala considered a bear? This is my backup joke. <laughs> he doesn't have the koalifications. Oh. <laughs> okay. I was looking for the answer, just a minute. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so like I said, we have the third quarter report as well as the uh, budget discussion. Uh, we'll start with the um, quarterly report, the non-financial piece of it. Uh, stormwater program for the third quarter, both permits, the shipping terminal and the airport, um, are in compliance with training and record keeping. At the airport, samples were taken and are within permit limits. At the shipping terminal, no sampling was required because there was no discharge during the facility open hours. Um, but responses to prior exceedances were in place by the end of August as required. Safety report. Oh, geez. Um, we've had two, only two recordable injuries this year so far. Uh, they were minor and there was no lost work on those. Public disclosure for the third quarter. We received 31 requests. Um, that's a total of 111 year to date. Um, took over 200 staff hours to fulfill those requests at a cost of about $25,000. And there were no serial requesters um, this quarter. Risk management activities. There were no major incidents through third quarter of 18 and no new claims for or against the port. We do have one open claim for the port. That's that windstorm that happened a couple years ago. We're still waiting um, to be able to do repairs in order to close that claim out. And then we do have three open claims against the port. They were slip and falls from 2017, and they, they just remain open. So that's it for the non-financial stuff. We'll move into the balance sheet. Nine months ago, we ended the year with $246 million net assets. Um, that's our net worth. We ended 
nine months later, uh, we increased total assets by about three million and decreased our liabilities by two and a half. So that increased our net worth by about five and a half million dollars. So I want everybody to grasp that. Would you say that again? And thank you, Mr. Fix, for your stewardship. We increased our assets by? Uh, about $3 million. And we decreased our expenses. Liabilities. By so we paid off bills about $2.5 million. I'm just proud of that. <laughs> it's going the right way. That's a good deal. Uh, yeah. Anybody who thinks we don't have the best port director on the planet? <clears throat> Mostly the staff. And staff. Oh, and commission, as long as we're throwing <laughs> compliments. <laughs> Better at living. Just better at it. Yeah. Okay. Current investments. Where are those? Um, we have fourteen and a half million dollars in these federal securities listed here, um, getting about one and a half percent interest on average. Um, yeah, I want to say about that. Uh, the balance of our invested cash is in the LGIP, about thirty million dollars, and that's earning two point one percent. So moving on to our operating um, divisions, each division, this is a little bit different, each division has two slides. The first slide will be year to date, first nine months, how we did compared to what we budgeted. And the second slide will be what we're forecasting to end the year and then what we're budgeting for 2019. So the aviation uh, division, first nine months came in a little over budget for revenues. That's that left two columns. Um, we reconfigured the general aviation rates at the end of 2017, and uh, that accounts for the revenues being a little higher. So the revenues aren't necessarily higher. It's the budget that was low because we didn't have those rates in time for our budget. And then expenses are coming in first nine months lower than, than budgeted, and that's really across the board. Advertising, outside services, um, really no specific line item, just across the board, cost controls. Looking forward to the end of the year and next year, we expect to come in at 6.9 million in revenues. Um, that's a little bit above what we budgeted. And then we budgeted about 7.3 for 2019. And expenses, looks like we're coming in about 300,000 lower than, than budget. I don't have the budget up here. I thought it was a little crowded. It was 5.6 or so. And then we're budgeting about the same for 2019. So no added costs at the airport. <laughs> the marinas division, first nine months, a little over budget for revenues, um, mostly the, the pleasure side of the business. And expenses are um, a little lower than budgeted, mostly due to staff. We had some vacancies at the harbors, and so those staff costs were low. But next year, hopefully, we don't have those vacancies. So what are we projecting for the end of the year? Just under $8 million in revenue and then um, projecting or budgeting 8.3 for 2019. And then the expenses, uh, we're expecting to just budget the same level of cost, uh, no big changes in the marinas division for 2019. So the cruise terminal, uh, the cruise terminal uh, the revenue and expenses are almost right on target. Revenues are a little high due to some extra sailings that we saw um, earlier this year. And then what are we looking at next year? Really, really just about the same as we did this year. Bellingham shipping terminal is a little bit of a different story. Um, we do continue to actively the mark and market the site and follow leads. Um, we're coming in just a little short of budget, about 70% of our revenues, but we're also coming in about 70% of our expenses. So those are really variable ex expenses. So as we have business, we'll increase expenses. So they're still, they're pretty level. What are we looking at next year? We expect to end the year under 800,000 in revenues, um, but we, like I said, we're really actively marketing this and uh, we expect those revenues to, to jump up to almost a million and a half next year, uh, along with the, obviously, the variable expenses to match. Real estate, you know, with high occupancy, it's not hard to predict revenues and expenses. Um, 
the expenses are a little low because we haven't needed to use things like um, outside services like appraisals or broker fees. So those have come in, come in a little bit low. Looking at next year, again, it's, you know, with this high occupancy, this, it is what it is, unless we add a building or sell a building or something like that. Our overhead divisions are admin, executive, planning, and facilities. And this is all combined. Uh, we have very minimal revenues for um, like lease and conduit rentals. Um, expenses are a little high year to date, but that's n nothing to be concerned about because we have a lot of front loaded costs like the audit cost and dues and such. Looking at next year, really just the same. We're not, um, we're not expecting to increase our expenses by much. And we'll probably come in lower than budget. We just, you know, we like to budget a little for some off stuff. Waterfront District. So we um, budgeted under 400,000 year to date and we've received uh, 600,000 and that's due to the increased lease at the F Street Warehouse. Um, we've, uh, we didn't budget for that. Um, and then expenses are lower than budget, mainly due to legal and outside services. We're just not using those services for the dis waterfront district as much as we thought we would. Looking forward, we expect to come in the end of the year at 800,000, but we're budgeting about a million for 2019. So a little increased activity there with about the same um, costs in 2019. So all other public, this is another um, interesting one. Um, revenues are pretty much the same. This is the facility rentals and such, but also this public also includes economic development. So while the expenses are lower than budget, it's that we were ramping up the, pro the program and these last few months we've seen it really start to ramp up. So we expect to end the year pretty close to budget. Um, and then also um, expect to continue into 2019 the same level of, of activity for this division. So that's it for the operating divisions. Are there any questions about that, about the budget or third quarter operating? No, great. The only question I had was earlier on um, the number of FOIA requests that you've received um, is that consistent with this time period in, let's say, last year? Or is it just all over the board? It's all over the board. Um, I know we're doing some work to try to get some information on the website so that we don't have to, to field those questions. Um, but it just comes in waves just depending on... What we say up here. Or what people do. Um, yeah. That's your fault. Is your fault. That's the, yeah. It's all on me. So one area that um, I do need commission direction on today, if possible, are the taxes. Um, so when I put the tax revenue in our cash flow to budget for 2019, I, I made some assumptions. I assumed that we would increase our tax base by 1%. We've done that probably 75% of the years that I've been here. Uh, last year we didn't, we just took the same, the same base. Um, that would be about $72,000 extra for 2019 if we took the 1%. And then I assumed that we would take the tax or levy tax on new construction, which we almost always do. So if those assumptions are correct and assessed values continue to increase, I plugged in a 4% um, for those, uh, the rate will remain flat or even decrease. So the, the top numbers up there, 2018, our rate was 0.2485 per thousand, and we were able to levy 7.2 million. So with these assumptions, um, our rate would be close to 2446, which is a little lower, and we bring in 7.4 million. Just remind the commission that you can legally levy up to 45 cents per thousand, uh, and you're at about 24 cents per thousand. However, you can't get to that 45 by more than 1% of your increments increases. Right. You're limited to a 1% year increase, plus new construction. Are my assumptions okay? 
I love your assumptions. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and we've got a lot of uh, new construction coming online, so. And the one percent is is Absolutely. okay. Okay. Great. So capital, I didn't really want to discuss too much capital today since we went through it a couple weeks ago, uh, line by line. But I, we did make a few changes since, oh, yes. You were looking for a head nod from all three of us on that? I was. I didn't nod. I didn't say anything. I saw that. So we're increasing about $200,000, if I read that correctly. Is that what it is? It could be. It's just under. But the rate is down. So it must Assuming for new construction, sorry. A hundred thousand. Oh, okay. I just took the average over the last few years. Are we switching roles here? I'm not one to be increasing taxes, period, if there's not a need for it. Given given what we saw at our, our budget retreat and that, I don't know that I'm comfortable with raising the tax at this point in time. Uh, to, to new construction, yes. But I, uh, when there's not a real need, I think we're doing. I think we're doing well. I feel we're doing well. We, we, we are. Can we can always use more money, but I don't know if we need to do that at the back of the, the folks of this county. With what's coming on with our our shipping terminal facility, hopefully increases in revenue there. Um, you know, and when you raise a tax, it, irregardless of how little it is to each person in the county, we're still raising a tax. And I'm not entirely sure there's a need to raise that tax at this point in time. That, that's where I stand on it. Commissioner, you may be correct, um, but I do want to point out that we have a very large list of unfunded projects uh, that we'd like to start chipping away at. And a lot of those unfunded projects don't have revenue streams or revenue sources. Uh, it's really easy for the staff to come to you with a new project in our marinas when we know that we're going to have the revenue to pay for it. It's a lot more difficult when we have a bulkhead that we don't have a revenue stream for. So that was our thinking going in by, on the 1%. That being said, we can make it work. If you decide you don't want to levy the 1%, we'll balance the budget without it. Uh, we would, I would encourage you to take the new construction because it doesn't affect anyone but the new construction. So that's 100000 there. Uh, but if the commission gives us direction to eliminate the one percent, we will figure that out. I just wanted to you understand why we got there is because of that unfunded list. I understand. I, I'm still not comfortable with raising the tax. The new construction, yes, but but the the other no. Do we want to give them some time to think about it? Do you don't you need an answer today or? What, what have we done for the, the past say, five years? We We've increased it once and didn't increase it four years, correct? I don't think that's right. I think it was three and two. It it's really bounces mm -hmm. back and forth. I thought we'd only increased it once, but so it's we've either increased one year or two years, but we have definitely not increased it all five. So it would have been the last two years that we took a one percent then. I think we did not take it in six. We did not take it in seven. We didn't take it in. <laughs> we didn't take it in 18. We took it okay. in 17. Okay. Yeah. This year we didn't take the 1%. Do we want to save this until after the unfunded discussion? You've got to give me a little bit of time to think about that now. Okay. Um, explain to us the difference between the, the rates, because the rate goes down for 2019. Because you have assessed value increases. So we're taking a 1% increase, but the assessed value increase is more than our 1%. If the assessed value increased less than 1%, then the rate would go up. But because the assessed value increases more than 1%, the rate goes down. A minor amount. Okay. And it went up about 8% this past year. And before that was 6% and then 2%. So I just plugged in a 4% trying to be conservative. So a homeowner will pay less to the port next year, even with the 1%. It'll be a lot less if you get rid of the one percent. And part of my thinking is that as staff, all of us are doing a very good job, and I think we continue doing a very good job. I don't feel we need to do that. That's that's where I'm at, because there's going to come a time in the future, some point in time, where we're going to have to say, hey, we really need some money, and you're going to need more money than we're looking at here, and and and. 
we're, we're showing that we're working hard in the times when we can and not increase taxes to people, but when the need is really there, then when you go there, you can look back and say, hey, we, we didn't just take it because we could. That, that's my thinking. Whether it's right, wrong, or indifferent, I don't know. <laughs> And we have a public hearing on October 6th, I'm sorry, November 6th and November 20th when you adopt the budget. Um, we, can, we can absolutely hold this until, until the next commission meeting. Yeah, I would like to do that um, okay. for a couple of reasons. Um, because I, I do see the list of the wish list. And you got a few up in Blaine. Hey, we've all got wish lists, but we all have to be realists about it, too. And we have a, uh, a limitation on what we can raise every year, so I'd hate to see something come up a couple of years from now and not have done this. But by that same token, I'm completely on board. Well, this is, every, this is every year, and if we, we, every yes. year it comes to us. So let's put this on hold and let's listen to the public hearing. Absolutely. Yeah. Not a problem at all. Are you okay with that? Yeah, I'm, my, my concern is that our co costs just are go up you know everything we do costs more um, and construction costs are up lots of costs are up and so it this is a way that we're able to mediate some of that and that that's my rationale not that not that we are managing our money poorly it's just that things cost more today than they have in the past years um, and so I'd want to know if if anything has to go on to the unfunded list because of that switch, you know, if we were, if we decide not to take that one percent, are we going to see anything more go on the? Un no, we won't oh. increase the unfunded no. list. You just in a couple of years, you won't have as big of a bank account to pull things off the unfunded list. You know, you're talking about a hundred thousand a year. So, okay. Yeah, we can make it work without it. As I understand, the average homeowner in Whatcom County pays around seventy dollars a year in taxes. I think it's about like yeah, seventy three for a three hundred thousand dollar home. I think yeah. that's the math. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's right. One percent isn't a big increase either way, but people I know people are feeling the burden of the amount of taxes that we're all being asked to pay. So I think it is a good question. So I think that I think that staff and, and all of us are smart enough to figure out a way to make the port and make money without going to the tax paper. I really believe we can do that. Yeah, this is I agree. And we're significantly under, you know, the threshold and we're far under what many other ports charge. Uh, when, it, when we saw that list come out uh, last week, we're certainly under what a lot of the uh, other ports in the state are charging. Great, okay, we'll revisit it in two weeks then. Unless you two want to decide tonight. No, I'm, I, I thought we were going to put it off. Yeah, that sounds fine. Excellent. And reflect. Go to Buddha. No, I'm yeah. going to reflect. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about the capital. Um, like I said, I wasn't going to go through a bunch of capital today since we did that two weeks ago, um, but there were some changes that staff made since that meeting. I just wanted to make the commission aware of it. We added $100,000 to the waterfront site prep. I think there was already 100, and we, we just increased that. We added $25,000 for the design of the Airport Industrial Park Flex Building. And then we added the uh, Gilnet Loading Zone ramp to the funded list. It was on the unfunded at 350. Um, we determined that it would probably only be about 160, and so we were able to move that onto the funded list for 2019. And what's that last one? The, it's the connection of the, uh, where we keep the fire boat dock now over to the floats oh. where they work in the Gilnet Loading Zone, because we removed that one boathouse for the overwater coverage. And I just wanted to uh, reiterate the 10 largest projects for 2019 that we have in the capital budget. Uh, that Seaview North building, uh, 2.5 million over two years. The Bulkheads and Blaine, 1.8 million. The Fisherman's Pavilion, 1.5. I asterisked that because we're looking for um, outside uh, funding help. Um, the HVAC Bayview building we have in the budget right now at 900000 I asterisked that also because um, facilities is looking at a different solution um, because that's a pretty big bill. So that may go down by the time we get there. And then the cruise terminal solar panels, 440000 I asterisked that because there is a 50% grant funding in the budget that we're counting on. 
Um, so if we don't get the 220 grant, then we'll need to figure that out. Uh, demolish the Lignum building at 405,000, main pier repairs at the shipping terminal for 400,000, improvements at Hilton Avenue for 375, and then the design of the QTA facility, that's a quick turnaround for the rental cars at the airport. That's just the design in 19, and then uh, 1.8 million construction in 2020. And then at the shipping terminal, fire suppression in both of the warehouses for 350,000, yes. Seaview North Wheel and I see the plus 500 King in 2020. I must have missed that when we were. What's 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 that? That was just, it was a, it's a 2.5 million dollar project, but we just didn't think we'd get it all done in 19. Okay. So we just moved the tail end of it out to 2020. Just timing. Okay. Do we want to have any additional discussion on capital tonight? Maybe we go up to 2.5 from two. It was always two. It's always two five. Yeah. Yeah. I think maybe when we first started talking this years ago, it was two. But so that's so these projects are in the capital budget and funded for 2019. Um. So if there are no questions there, I want to. Oh, so projected cash flow. <clears throat> if we do everything that we say we're going to do, the operating comes in as planned. Um, all the capital projects are done. Um, We'll begin the year with 13.7 in cash, probably more than that just because there's lag time with capital projects, but that's dedicated to 2019 um, activity. Sources of cash, 49 million, that's all in. That's operating and grants and um, uh, taxes and PFCs. Uses of cash, almost 49 million. Again, that's all in. Debt, capital, operating costs, cleanups. End the year with about 14.3 million. We need to reserve. Uh, 9.8 is the calculation, and then projected ending available cash at year end of 2019 is 4.5. So you asked if we could absorb that 72,000, the 1%, that would just come off the bottom there. We're not so tight, we can't do that. And then I wanted to give the commission an opportunity to talk about the unfunded. A couple weeks ago, um, I think you said you wanted to discuss it at tonight's meeting. So I'm going to ask what the pleasure of the commission is. Do you want to take them one by one and discuss them, or do you want to pull one out and say this is one that I feel particularly strong about? How would you like to proceed? I mean, we know what this is. Is really much discussion? We can. I, I don't know. That That's we need my to spend take. a lot of time this evening with folks here to, to discuss these unfunded. Except to know that they're unfunded. You know, we wanted you to have the opportunity, if you're passionate about one of them, to make an argument for it. Uh, otherwise, we'll leave it as is. You know, I think, personally, I'm passionate about getting all of them done. <laughs> it's a list that needs to get done, I mean, eventually in time. But uh, there's nothing that reaches right out and slaps me in the face. I mean, it's, it's, it's stuff we all, that's been put off for, some of it's stuff that's been put off for years, and we need to, we need to get to it. But I don't, at this point in time, I don't have something that I'm going to argue for on that unfunded list. I mean, there's a couple that I might uh, look at next year that's more strongly than I would this year, but I think this year we've got enough on our plate. And some of them aren't aren't ready to go. Mm -hmm. Right. That's so, right. Some of them are and some, some of them are placeholders to possibly move up anyways. That's right. So, yeah. Okay. No, I, I feel like we had a good conversation about these already. I don't have a whole lot else to have now. Okay. Great. So we'll just leave it as is. As is. Perfect. Agreed. Yes, yes, agreed. Agreed. All right, next step. So we will get the budget on the website available to the public on Monday. And then, like I said, November 6th, we'll have a public hearing. Uh, we'll revisit the, the tax question. And then on November 20th, we'll have a second public hearing, and we'll ask the commission to adopt the budget so that it can be filed with the county on time. Are there any additional questions or comments? I have done a very good job. Thank you. Thank you. I have a lot swirling, but it's stuff that not for this meeting. Be in two weeks. You will. Thank you. All right. Well done. Thank you.
events and public parks update, Gina. So good evening, I'm Gina Stark. I'm a communication and research coordinator for the Economic Development Division. Um, and I'm excited, this is my, this is my first project and presentation um, since first joining the port. Um, so this is just gonna be a really quick um, presentation on some findings. So overall, the purpose of this was that the commission asked the question, is there an economic benefit to having private events in public parks? And more specifically, we're talking about ticketed events. So we're talking like concerts and stuff. So um, that's the overall purpose of um, what was put before me. So briefly, I just wanted you guys to know that parks overall, especially in Washington State and in Whatcom County, um, really provide a large economic um, benefit to our communities. So you can see in Washington State alone, 2.16 billion in spending in Washington State. And in our county, um, it is seven, a little over $700 million in our county alone. And that the total expenditures for specialized events, which is kind of like your marathons, your golf tournaments, you know, other than just your general hiking, biking, skiing that goes on, um, represents almost $60 million. So this here is just kind of a brief, so you guys kind of see where the expenditures go, where it's broken out. So a lot of money is obviously spent on food services, drinking places, so we've got a lot of microbrews, so you can imagine where some of that money goes to. Um, hotels, motels, and then it goes down to um, retail. So you can also see um, gas, our gas stations, petroleum really benefits from folks coming into our region and doing, um, being in our parks, being on our lakes, being on our trails. And then this right here is just a quick snapshot of the total jobs um, that are created due to um, participation in our recreation. So again, food service and retail are really a big um, part of the benefits that um, our community gets from recreation. So specifically though, my task was to look at the economic benefits of a closed ticketed event. Um, and if we are closing the park, is that really a benefit or is it really more of a cost and we're just doing it because we think it's an economic benefit? So the first thing is there were lots of um, economic analysis out there about the benefits of recreations, but when you dig a little deeper in all of them, they define events or special events um, as public lands such as youth tournaments, marathons, bike races, and other participatory um, events. So when you look at these ticketed events and closing the park, that's not included under special events in any of the analysis that were done. So um, one of my big challenges was there hasn't a study that's already been done on a broad basis about what is the economic impact, good or bad. So um, my research method was to reach out to various municipalities, to reach out to municipalities that are similar in our makeup and size um, on the West Coast and the East Coast and in between. So I didn't just keep it to a single region. I really wanted to throw it as wide as possible. Um, and then there were a couple of very individual studies that were done by some municipalities who were asking this question themselves. Um, and so I reviewed those and I reached out to those uh, municipalities. And then you can see really quickly some of the survey questions. When I emailed, I phone called, talked to a lot of um, municipalities, which was really very eye-opening for me. Um, so basically it was, you know, um, did you completely close your park for a ticketed event? So we're not talking about like renting a gazebo or having a wedding. It's specifically for this um, type of an event. How many times, what was their fee structure? Um, what was their annual revenue? Um, what was the economic impact to the businesses, good or bad, and the uh, impact to the community, again, good or bad? Um, I didn't get, always get answers to all of these questions, um, but a lot of municipalities were really great about sharing what they could. So these are two case studies, and the reason why I put these two up, because these are both municipalities who went forward and 
and decided to have concerts and ticketed events in their um, communities. And then in both cases, um, there was an initial negative impact, whether it was alcohol, um, noise, um, a destruction of the park, for instance, like it was really muddy, ended up tired tacked, uh, tracks kind of ripped up the grass, so that kind of damage. So each of these, in each of these cases, what they did is they pulled back and they each created a task force and looked at their own individual communities and began to really assess, is this something that we should be moving forward? And if we move forward, then what are some of the policies that we need to change or put into place? Um, so um, with Santa Barbara, they had a very large three-stage event. So it was, it was decent size. 98,000 was their revenue. Um, and so again, what they decided to do, that they were created their own special policies around special events. They didn't have anything. They had general parks, but they didn't have anything specifically about um, special events. Thing that makes Santa Barbara a little different from Austin is that um, they currently aren't really doing a lot of special events, but it had nothing to do with negative impact. What it had to do is just staff capacity, that they have so many other events like, you know, bikes and runs and all those other types of things that um, for them, and again, this is for Santa Barbara, they said that these concerts took so much time for staff to make sure that all the rules and regulations were being followed that at this particular time, it was just something that they couldn't pursue. But it's not that they're not going to pursue it. Can you clarify a point for me? Sure, sure. That, so they were actually physically taking on the responsibility of putting these events on themselves, not um, leasing the property no, to they a private lease, vendor. No, they do lease the property, but when you're talking about an event that has approximately 300 people, and so there's certain things that you have to make sure in place, like safety. So they have to work with the sponsors to make sure that they coordinate with the local law enforcement. Um, noise abatement, make sure that they follow the rules about, you know. So it's just basically following up with the sponsor or sponsors, um, depending on how big the event, to ensure that they're following the rule set forth by the city. And that does take time and coordination to make sure that all the permits are, you know, filed properly, everybody's properly contacted. Um, so that's kind of the type of work that it takes. And were these events in the core of their downtown or were they in the periphery? Um, these, uh, this particular one was in one of their core parks in Austin City. They have about three core parks that they have events in, which they have a lot more than just three. So um, with the various municipalities, it just depends, and that's something that they consider is, is this an appropriate spot? Um, what's the surrounding community look like? Um, so for each municipality, it's a little different depending on what their makeup is. Yeah. Um, so this is kind of my overall findings. So you asked those who didn't do any private events, why? There really wasn't any particular reason. Majority of it was A, because their parks didn't have the capacity. It wasn't um, like Montana was one, where their parks wasn't constructed in such a way that they could actually close it off to anybody. Um, so that was kind of a, a, a lot. Um, the other was that nobody had ever asked them or approached them to do this, so they never thought about doing it, and it just wasn't a policy. Um, very few, um, when I talked to them, asked them, you know, is this something you would do? Would you consider? I think two, and only really one, adamantly said no. It's just something that they would never do. Um, they just didn't feel it was appropriate to um, deny access to community members, and that was their, their wording. But that was one out of um, all the various ones that I reached out to. Um, so private events, so there is an economic benefit to it. Um, if you think about um, people that come here for biking and hiking and kayaking, um, you're opening up the parks to a newer market that wouldn't have normally have come here. Um, a lot of times if you are coming to a concert, um, especially if it's a bigger name concert, um, then people will tend to stay overnight, especially maybe if they come in, even like say they're coming from Linden or Blaine and there's a beer garden, they might decide to stay close and, and so not to drive home. So that's money that they are spending um, 
in our, in, let's say in Bellingham. On the average, somebody who does come in and spend the night um, for an event spends an average of about $200. Um, when I talked about, if you talk about businesses, um, you know, a couple of surveys, Austin City did a survey of their downtown businesses. Um, most of them kind of said, yeah, that there is some economic benefit. It's not like a super huge economic benefit where they hired additional staff for those particular days or those particular events, but they saw it as a positive and they did see some increase in, in revenues. Um, when various communities um, were asked and surveyed about it, most said that they were fine with it, looking about 75%. Um, one of the main things, as long as you work with them, let them know what's going on, give them forewarning so then they can, you know, um, address it or express their concerns. Um, and then, again, this is something that, you know, if you're talking about you know, we think of these concerts, we're thinking these bigger ones, you know, we're not talking Coachella or South by Southwest, you know, or stuff that goes on in Seattle. That's where a lot of this activity tends to happen. Um, but it does happen on a smaller scale in communities of our, of our size and across the board, they had strict policies on what was allowed and what was not allowed, which just brings me to my, um, very quick recommendations, and these again aren't my personal recommendations. These are just across the board from municipalities that dealt with this, the policies that they had in place and had expressed that um, you know that's important to think about. So if we create new policies, obviously bring together a small group um, to discuss these policies, um, develop a partnership. Again, I talked about safety, noise, traffic. Um, so just create strong partnerships with those. Um, Again, have a strong partnership, which we already do with the port, with our surrounding communities, just so that they are aware of what's going on. Um, develop specific policies pertaining to special events. Um, evaluate the most appropriate place, dates, and times to have these events, and how many you want to have per year. Um, so those are kind of just your overall um, very basic recommendations, just things to think about if the port decides to go forward. And that's it. Any questions? Gina, how many? Uh, mm, go ahead. How many different municipalities did you contact? You, you mentioned you contacted a number. Um, I contacted about twenty different municipal. Well, actually, I reached out to a lot more. I received feedback and spoke to about twenty municipalities. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and were those ones that you were matching kind of for a like size to ours? Most of them were, yes, for like sizes. There were a few, so um, the city of Vancouver, obviously the city of Seattle, um, you know, Austin is obviously a little bit bigger than, than we are. Um, but again, because we know that they have events, and so I wanted to at least reach out to, to them and get their feedback. Did Seattle and Vancouver participate? Uh, Seattle did, um, and they said that they do close their parks, but they don't close them all 100%, um, and that their revenue base kind of varies, um, and that they do have, I mean, they have a whole department, basically, for such special events. Um, so that was pretty much the information that they provided. Yeah. Can you go back a slide? I just want to... Sure. I want to ruminate on that a bit. Yeah. Ruminate? Yeah. <laughs> wow. That's the word of the day, ruminate. That, well, he's ruminating. If, yes. that, if that pops in your email, you know it came from. Could, I, <laughs> could you email me this presentation absolutely. again, please? Thank yeah, you. Yeah, absolutely. How's that ruminating coming? Yeah. <laughs> I just, well, my, I'll just say it. Um, just a, I don't, I don't know what that means. <laughs> I don't know that we need a, a work group to establish whether or not we want to throw up. Yeah. That part. There's just a lot yeah. of steps involved in this that are just crap. Yeah. Well, and <laughs> again, <laughs> when, when we talk about... <laughs> we're adults and we were elected to do this job, and if we think we can close off a park and have a, a venue that makes sense, and we can evaluate whether or not it's going to have a harmful impact on our community, that 
I get it. I'm I'm not dealing. I'm in a public agency now, and it's a whole different game. So, so Commissioner, the, the reason we're even doing this presentation is because there, this did come up when we were talking about closing the parks. We didn't have the answers, so we wanted to get the answers. We have direction from you on how to go forward on this. We don't need any further direction. I think we're pretty clear on the direction, and it didn't involve establishing small work groups. So unless you direct us to establish the small work groups, we're not going to go that route. But we did want to circle back around with you and close this out. That's why I wanted to ruminate. I had to figure out what words I wanted to say. Is that one in the Webster Dictionary? Did you look that up or what? Yeah, and I think really more to the work group is just a potential of, you know, a, a general consensus. So it's not a, you know, a, in any of these cases, a single person didn't just go forth and say, we're changing these policies. So, yeah. So I, I assume you intend to go ahead with some more detailed work on this or findings or not? If that is the direction of the commission, I am happy to, yes. I guess one thing I would ask for, because I'm one of the, or the main opposer to, to this, is <laughs> I, I would like an estimated cost of what's involved. Um, you, spoke, you spoke to ports not having, or, or cities not having enough people to do the job. I would like a ballpark figure of what it actually costs the port or the city to police, so-called police, and set up this event so that we have a ballpark figure for a cost. And then, you know, when we're leasing ground to someone, does that cover all that or doesn't it? So yeah. unless we have some kind of number, and we're going to ask you for that, yeah. I would assume we're going to ask anyways, what's it going to cost us, you know, to what we're getting back? So I'd like to have a ballpark figure to work with when, when this comes before us again um, for these events so we have some idea if it, if it even balances out whether it's worth doing or not. Yeah. So, was, Tiffany, I know for Sea Feast we tracked religiously what our costs were from the port. Did we do that for the concert that occurred in August? Do we know specifically what our co our costs were? Um, Tiffany D. Simone, Meetings and Events Supervisor. So, though that event, we charge the customer. We're not a sponsor of right. that event. So the costs are to them. If there are additional maintenance costs or they break something, we will charge that back to the customer. But did the, I guess the commissioner is asking if there is police presence, did the city pay for extra police to be there, that kind of stuff? No, we did not pay for any of that. Right, but that's before. what I'm getting to. I'd, I'd like a ballpark number of the costs incurred by the city as well as the port. What goes if we have to have other? Oh, the city charges an event like that for for that kind of. Good, so that so they have a set fee. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if I could have that set fee along what? with what we thought, so that we know if there's if we're making any money on this deal. Well, we don't pay that fee. Right. Right. I know we don't. The organizer does. I'm trying to get at how much. It, they have to pay to do an event. Is this worth doing to them even? I mean, how much the organizer yeah, has to pay? Yeah, how much? How much? It would depend on the size. Of around. course, it would just depend well, on the depend size on and them. the scope. Well, mm -hmm. if they go in this and they lose money, that's on them. That's mm -hmm. not on us. I get that, but the thing we're doing is we're closing the park, and if they're not making any money doing it, why are we closing the park to the public? Okay, if they're not making any money putting the event on, why are, why are we closing our park? Is what I'm getting at. Well, because the right-hand side of that policy back there showed the economic benefit of somebody spending no, that's, that's a number. $200 per day. So if you're going to ask you, for you the... you think the people that came to the concert we had here spent $200? Each one of them spent $200 around here? I, I, I kind of don't I, think I so. I know a couple of people who spent probably 40 to 50 so just, on, just on beer alone. <laughs> so they were over drinking and raising hell. Well, then they had to stay somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> they weren't sleeping in their cars. <laughs> But, yeah, there's an economic benefit anyway, to everything. Anyway, I'd like to see some numbers of the whole thing of what, what the city charges to have, you know, what it actually costs the person that's putting the event on for police coverage and, and I'm assuming there's damage deposits and so on and so forth. So. I'm sure we could reach out to that, that particular organizer and see what his costs were. Mm -hmm. yeah. If he's willing to share. Any other questions? And, Tiffany, for one, one of the 
questions that comes up um, in Gina's work, and Gina, thank you for doing all that research. I, it's um, it's always takes a, a lot more effort when that re information isn't readily available. So you got to do primary research here. It's great. Um, did one of the concerns was an, enough staff time in the organization to mm -hmm. facilitate the you know execution of, of, of an event. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure that the amount of inquiries that you, we received and just putting on the event is taxing on your time. Did you have enough time to dedicate to making this event happen? You're speaking about the, the summer's yeah. end event? Yeah. Uh, certainly, yeah. Um, each, we're talking about different kinds of events kind of over the scope of what our department handles. So um, this is similar to somebody renting you know, the, the entire cruise terminal and, and the logistics that go around with, with that and the paperwork that needs to be submitted for that. So, yeah, similar. I, I mean, I think, again, it would depend on the scope. Right. Um, the timing matters, time yeah. of year. Yeah. Um, and I think that, you know, I don't think anybody wants to have tons, you know, many more work groups, but there are some important questions to identify around, around the timing. Mm -hmm. um, and when is the, the best time of year for an event? What are the best weekends? What are the best days? Mm -hmm. um, and how do we manage that process so it's as mm -hmm. smooth and effective as possible? Mm -hmm. So, and, and is our fee structure right? I think that's another question that we should be asking. For this particular event, yeah. I, I certainly agree. And, and what I heard at the last commission meeting was you kind of wanted to go forth with the RFP the way we discussed it um, for 2019, sounds mm -hmm. like. Yeah. Um, they, they want to come back, don't they? The, the summer's end, they want to do this one more year, I'm at not, least. I'm not sure. I haven't heard from Alex. I, they, they would be the true test as to whether or not this was sure. valuable. If they want to come back, then we provided a great venue mm -hmm. and value to them. Yeah, I'm saying. You can okay. try. Any other questions? <laughs> Good. Thank you. Thank you. An amazing amount of work. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Um, I'm going to break early for the uh, 5:30. Instead of we instead of moving to the action items, we're going to take a uh, let's call it eight minute break and meet at uh, 25 till or 6:35. Is it work? 5:35. Come back here. Thank you. you can take.
continued later, Darren. That'll be continued later, oh, that okay. conversation. All right, All right we're going to reconvene uh, the public meeting. Um, anyone wishing to speak in the public session, uh, please do. You've got three minutes to say anything you would like to to the commission. We'll hold this to a few minutes. Anybody signed up? We don't have anyone signed up currently. Anybody wishing to speak? All right. We will close the public comment period. Move on to action items. Adam or John? A motion to authorize the executive director to execute a contract with Dormaca USA, Incorporated of Lancaster, Pennsylvania, to manufacture and install a double automated secure exit lane, or ASEL, for the Bellingham International Airport in the amount of two hundred and thirty-two thousand seventy-three dollars seventy-one cents, plus a ten or twenty percent contingency for a total authorized contract amount of $278,488.45. Supervisor for the Aviation Division. I uh, just want to give you a little background on this, this project and kind of how it came to be and, and what, what it looks like in the future. Um, so the automated secure exit lane is an emerging technology that's being used to meet TSA regulations, specifically for the separation of screen passengers and non-screen passengers. Uh, what it does is it allows for one-way traffic to flow from what we call the sterile area, that's the boarding gate area, into the public area. That's where the bag claim and ticketing is located. Um, currently, we have a system set up where it's just a door that is guarded by a person. Uh, it's the TSA officer from the first departure until the last departure. So it's around usually 3.30 a.m. until anywhere between 3 p.m. and 7 p.m. And then it's a private security guard uh, through the port security contract with Pacific Security that uh, guards the lane from that last departure until the last arrival, which is usually around 12.30 a.m. or 1 a.m. Uh, what this does, it eliminates the need for that individual to be there as a guard. Um, the real uh, kind of driver for this is that there's an uncertainty on whether the future, the TSA will be required to staff that exit lane. Because right now they are mandated by Congress to staff that exit lane uh, while they're open, but not after. So if the last about four uh, cycles of the presidential budget have called for the cut of that program, it's been continually reinstituted by Congress, but we think it's kind of a matter of time, the writing's on the wall, to see that program be eliminated and shift that burden to the airports sometime in the near future. Uh, we did get two responsive bidders, and Dorn Macaba was selected as the lowest responsive bidder for this project. Just to kind of give you an idea, do, do you have a question? Or, oh, okay, yeah, look on your face. <laughs> Uh, to give you an idea what these what these doors look like, these are two Dorma Cabo projects from other airports in the United States. Uh, they currently have about 16 of their air, uh, doors installed at other airports in the U.S. and uh, more around the world from there. Um, the first one on your left is the Fort Lauderdale Airport. Uh, this is one of their first installations they did. This is a three-door system at Fort Lauderdale. We'd be looking at a two-door system or two-lane system. Uh, but this gives a really good view of kind of what these lanes look like. Uh, they're you know a little bit longer. They have a multiple door set inside. Uh, and uh, if you look on the right, that's Phoenix Mesa. That's more of what you would see here with uh, you're standing kind of in the, pa in, the, in the public area from both of these pictures, but it would be framed up. The door would be framed up similar to the way you see the one Phoenix Mesa is there. Big difference is we would not have the, uh, the, the our glass would be clear and not, not the clouded glass. So the, um, again, the big drive here is the return on investment. Um, like we said, TSA is currently mandated uh, to post personnel at those non-automated non exits. You see at many airports around the country, uh, but this is changing. This is the, the way of the future, these automated exit lane doors. Uh, we have the private security afterwards. Uh, that costs us the port currently around $41,000 per year. That's about our current cost. Uh, at those numbers, if they stay consistent, we'd see about an eight-year return on investment. If we switch to the, if, if the Congress does decide to change and the budgets get passed and the TSA is no longer required to staff that door for the times they're open, our cost would increase to close to $137,000 per year and would drop that from an eight year return on investment to a three year return on investment for the store. So what's preventing someone from going through that door? I see all the signs that say don't go through. The person standing guard currently. The automated system. Oh, the automated system. Uh, it's a lot of bells and whistles and machinery and uh, sensors that kind of work all in unison as well as they work with our, with our security systems. They all integrate into our current security systems to help prevent that. And the TSA does test these doors for approval before they will allow us to use them without a guard there. I can speak from experience. If you go through that the wrong way, 
everybody in the city knows that you've gone through that the wrong yeah. way. Yeah, there's a, a full response from our security staff if someone tries to go through the wrong direction. SWAT team comes down on ropes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm assuming they're sophisticated enough to identify people coming both both ways through the door at the same time, so they're probably counting bodies coming in two directions. Correct. So yeah, they have some very, that. very advanced sensor systems in there. Um, if you're interested, I do have uh, some I'm basic not. information I'm I can send take to your you. word on so, this. Okay. Um, and if TSA <laughs> I didn't has want to go into quite that detail, it, then I'm here sure it's going to be sufficient. The account that I saw was he got through the system, forgot something, turned around to go back through, and when he turned around just as he got past, mm -hmm. he started to go the wrong direction, and it just went berserk. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, machine guns. Most the airports I've been to. With the automated doors, there's still a guy sitting there. That's usually a choice by the airport to do that. Uh, this, uh, I can say, um, for uh, Fort Lauderdale and, uh, for example, does not have a person staged there, uh, nor does Phoenix Mesa anymore. So our intent is not to have some, someone sitting there. That's anyway. correct. And where will our responders come from when the bells and whistles go off? What so, post will they leave? Yeah, that would be our uh, security personnel and our ARF personnel at the airport, as well as our on-site law enforcement officer. People we have on site already. Correct. Okay. So this doesn't create a new, a need for a new position for someone to respond to this? No, sir. Okay. So two comments on this. I've often wondered, first of all, the guy we've got out there at Bellingham, friendliest guy you'll ever meet. He says hello to everybody who walks off the plane. Everybody. It's amazing. But I've often wondered why we need to have him when this is an option. So I'm in full support of this. Secondly, um, I was also greeted by one of the ARF um, people coming off the plane the last time, and he was also amazing. Um, That's great to hear. What an amazing presence it was to have him welcome us as we came off. So just on that note, it was a great experience coming off the plane. But I am also a big fan of, of promoting this, especially with an eight-year ROI. I uh, do have a little heartburn with this, and I have to, I have to you know, we're supposed to put people to work. And when we do these automated things, we're taking jobs away. So that's the part that bothers me. That's what I, well, that's what I tussle with is, you know, we're, we're going to take four people's jobs away and put some automatic doors there over some, uh, you know, some money. And, and I understand we have to, we have to balance it, but how do we balance the money that we're saving against the people we're putting out of work? That's the problem I have with this. You know, not that I'm against it. I just want to state that I'm not real comfortable with it because this is the way our country goes and then we can't figure out why nobody has a job. I will only say that I'm sh pretty sure I could take the guy who's sitting at the desk. I know I can't take the door if I'm coming through that airport. So I'm from a security... Don't worry about the door or the guy. From the security standpoint, accomplishing the goal that TSA set out, um, I think the door is a much more secure environment. That absolutely is a more secure environment, yes. And automation is happening throughout every sector of every employment aspect of this country and world. Um, we can't put our finger in the dike on it with this, with this issue or others. I think all we can do is make sure that we're investing in new technology, we're investing in opportunities that we have, like the shipping terminal, great example, investing where we can to put people to work and looking at current technologies that are going to provide employment because automation happens everywhere and it's it it's um you know it, it's it, it's meaningful it's people's employment but um it's also the the way business is occurring throughout the world and it's not something that i feel i can um really dictate any other comments there always is, has to be somebody to speak up to stop something. Remember that. I have any no more comments. comments on your side. I don't, uh, my only question is, is there any 90% uh, match from FAA? For not, not for this. No, FAA doesn't fund this. This is a security-related project. So, and it's so they not. don't fund any security-related. And TSA wouldn't fund this even if they are going to continue being in operation because this would ultimately save them money. It, correct. Yeah. Actually, and what, what it will do with the TSA officer that currently is stationed there will allow free them up to actually be help in the in the passenger screening area. So it help hopefully our, our plan there our hope would be that it expedites passenger screening. Hopefully we're able to get an international rivals um, situation that puts a whole bunch of customs and TSA people to work when we have uh, some flights to sunny Mexico. That'd be great. One more question yeah. with the statement you just made. Am I to assume 
or understand that these folks will move to a different place in the uh, airport and work and won't be displaced? The TSA officer is correct. The, the private security, that's the only position we have currently at the airport is with them, but they do have a large contract here with the port and with other entities, so in the Whatcom County and Skagit County. All right, thank you. Okay, any other comments? I don't have any. Maybe. A motion to authorize the executive director to execute a contract with Dormaca, Dormacaba? Dormacaba. Thank you. USA Incorporated, Oven Line, Cascare, Pennsylvania, to manufacture and install a double automated secure exit lane for the Bellingham International Airport in the amount of $232,073.71, plus a 20% contingency for a total authorized contract amount of $278,488.45. Commissioner Briscoe. Commissioner Shepard. Aye. Aye. Commissioner Bell is also an aye. Thank you. All right, action item number two. A motion to authorize the executive director to execute change order number one to the public works contract with Faber Construction in the amount of $32,325.91 for a revised total contract amount of $332,235.56. Uh, good afternoon, Commissioners. Adam Fulton, Director of Facilities. Uh, approximately 20 months ago, the Commission uh, approved uh, the facilities uh, staff to use a new bidding mechanism called the Small Works Roster. The Small Works Roster is used by most every other port in the state uh, our size, if not every single one of them. Uh, it also involved with the use of that tool was the increase the Commission approved uh, to our Executive Director, increasing his spending authority from 25000 up to 300000 uh, as long as this tool is the uh, mechanism for that bid. Uh, just wanted to give the Commission an update on the success of that tool and uh, as well as uh, and as well as have an action item for you at the end the um, it's, it's certainly been successful we think we've seen what, what the Commission has hoped for and that we have uh, gotten uh, I would say more bidders more local bidders into our uh, contracting for smaller jobs uh, with contractors that have a, a lower bonding capacity, um, suddenly they're bidding our work uh, for projects in that $150,000, $200,000 range. So I, I believe there's been some real success there. Um, one thing for sure is it's made us more nimble and responsive. Uh, when we go through our formal bid process, it takes approximately eight weeks from the time we advertise to the time we're able to award, depending on our timing with, with this meeting. Uh, however, uh, now with the small X roster, that eight weeks is reduced down to about three weeks. So it, it has helped us uh, as an agency be responsive and nimble in uh, taking care of concerns around the port, et cetera. Uh, we are very careful in its deployment. Um, what the commission might recognize from the last action item was it was below $300,000. Why didn't we use the small works roster? Why, why it was an action item and not simply a consent agenda? Uh, and that's because uh, one of the classic misuses of the small works roster is for an agency to divide up a project such that all the pieces are small enough that they can all be small works roster and, and it kind of flies under the radar. Uh, we don't want to even come close to that sort of impropriety. So in this case, uh, we elected to take that, the project you just had, the ASEL uh, exit lanes, out to a formal bid because we know there's a second part to this project um, that's going to be basically fitting the casing and housing around that, um, uh, that tool, the ASEL. And, but we didn't know at the time of bid what that tool would be, so we couldn't design it then, and we didn't want to uh, do both of those halves of the project, i.e. this vendor that supplies this ASEL tool, and then the contractor that uh, builds housing around it. We didn't want to do those both by small works roster because it would be over 300000 by the end of the day. Um, careful to note is that the, the project has to be uh, estimated at below 300000 So... Um, one of the reasons that we're here today is because um, the market is just so high that even our historic estimating put our put the project you're about to see around two hundred fifty thousand dollars, and yet six bids came in all from two ninety nine to three forty. So um, so it has even though we're entirely legal, everything's you know, published estimate and everything else. Uh, there just maybe is this appearance of impropriety, and so 
uh, with Commissioner Fix's uh, direction, we want to uh, just make absolute every use of this tool audit proof. And For the record, I'm not elected. <laughs> you say elected. Oh. But we well, can I'd take vote. a we can take a vote. Yeah. Well, I'd vote for you. All right. You got one. So um, sorry about that. The uh, anyway, so just to give you just a just very briefly a little more guts on the program uh, is our. I'd like to have two of my staff come along. First is our contracts administrator Anthony Emirati, and next will be the project engineer John Gibson. Thanks. Adam, real quick, you yes. mentioned that you, you, we've seen a greater diversity in the type of yeah. uh, contractors that are bidding or getting awarded for those small works contracts. Correct. Um, what is what's triggering that? I don't, I don't well, I think it's um, I think what it is. Uh, I've been bidding here with the port for a long time, and, and um, classically, what we would do is group like work, uh, thinking we are into an economy of scale. Um, you know, so for instance, we would say, oh, that's a building project, that's a building project out at the airport, out in Fairhaven. So we group all those together, and suddenly the project would be very large, maybe in the million or, or $2 million range. Well, then what that does is has the effect of limiting who has the bonding capacity to do the project. So suddenly when we're bidding projects in that hundred to 200000 uh, several of the contractors that are local here can, can bid it, and, and we've seen that. And so I think that's a successful, I think it was the commission's hope and I think it's happening, so. Adam, I'd, uh, uh, I'd just like to point out that uh, the people of Whatcom County and myself greatly appreciate your effort at transparency for what we're doing here, thank you. I greatly appreciate you saying that, Commissioner, I really do, thank you. And uh, I will tell you, I'm uh, like, commission, like Director Fix would say, you're only as good as your staff. And I don't mind surrounding myself with giants. And as you're about to see these two gentlemen, you realize what I'm talking about. Yeah. Good evening, commissioners. Anthony Amirati, uh, contracts administrator. Just going to walk you through this slide here. It's a matrix setup. Talk about public works and what is it? So it's all work, construction, alteration, repair, or improvement other than ordinary maintenance. It's the project you just actually approved. It's construction. Uh, and the way the port goes about the, the two processes that we follow, we follow either the formal bid process, as Adam mentioned, over $300,000, or the small works under $300,000. Uh, those are the triggers for which one we use. They are both sealed bids. However, the formal bid process, we have uh, an official opening where the public can come in, and I open up our bids right here. I read them out aloud. They're open for inspection. Uh, we then post the results and come to you for approval. Um, part of that is that we have to actually advertise in the Bellingham Herald. Uh, we run a notice, it's a public notice, and we have to have 13 days allowed for contractors to review the plans and to put their bids together. Uh, and then afterwards, again, we come back and we get your approval for them. With the Small Works roster bids, they're sealed bids that come in and we <coughs> review them similar to the quotes. Um, but how we arrive at the roster is we have this directory uh, it's through MRSC, and that's the Municipal Research and Services Center. And they're a directory that contractors can go and put all their qualifications and register and also select different agencies, so the port, Whatcom County, uh, cities. And this is throughout the whole state. So MRSC is a, a very good hub for these contractors to get their qualifications out there so that we can then go to the roster and say, all right, well, I need plumbers, I need electricians, and then we can solicit from those po folks who have registered on, on that site. So that's why we're also getting to all these other smaller companies is because they not only register with us, but they might have a statewide roster that they are involved as, you know, they have their hands in everything. Um, all across. So the difference also is that the small works roster, we do not come to you for your approval. We do get you to ratify the contract that uh, our director Fix signs. And uh, that's pretty much the, the real big differences between the two procurement methods. Um, since we've put the small works roster in place, we've actually increased the number of contracts that we were doing. We were doing an average of about 13 a year up to 25. Uh, so we've significantly increased the number of contracts we have, and as Adam said, we've been able to spread them across a lot more smaller contracts, uh, contractors. Um, so other than that, uh, the, the last little chart there, we have a little breakout of, of how we're going with this, and 
Historically, before we had the small works roster, it was 100% formal bid, every single one of them. Uh, right now, currently, uh, this year, we're tracking to do about 84% of our contracts through the small works roster. Uh, we've been able to have a lot smaller projects that um, we can do it that way. So that's really all I have right now. Uh, I'm going to pass it to John, unless you have any questions. I have none. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Spoken like a real giant. Charlie Green or just John? Good afternoon, Commissioners. John Gibson, Project Engineer. And I'm just going to walk you through this Blaine Webhouse Number 1 preloading project. Uh, this was awarded to Faber Construction. Uh, as Adam mentioned, uh, this has been a really useful tool for the Engineering and Facilities Department. Uh, it, it allows us to be a little more nimble while still operating within uh, the appropriate laws and regulations. This was a perfect example of uh, when that tool came into play. We had started the design process for the Webhouse One uh, project, and as you'll recall, this project is going to install a new web house uh, down by the Blaine boat launch on Mill Holland Drive next to uh, web houses one and two. Uh, as we got into design, uh, we took some soil borings and had those analyzed by our geotechnical engineer. As you know, this site uh, is built on dredge spoils from when the harbor was expanded. So the soil profile wasn't a total surprise, but when he evaluated the live loads and the dead loads that would be imparted by the proposed building, uh, his models were forecasting about four inches of settlement after the building was in place. And obviously there's ways to work around that with uh, the ways that you install your utilities and um, address your paving and your sequence of work there. But ideally, uh, you get that settlement out of the way before you even start construction. And that's what we opted to do in this case. So um, we were able to act pretty quickly and get a simple set of plans put together, put it on the small works roster. And as you'll see later in the presentation, um, it was a very attractive project to a lot of our contractors because it was uh, a, very, a very simple, clean project. Uh, this is just a photo of the site before we started work, and I'm going to try to breeze through these pretty quickly out of respect for everything else that's on your action agenda here. Um, but the basic scope of work consisted of coming in and stripping off the, the first foot or so of topsoil and uh, grass and other organic material that obviously wouldn't make a good foundation for a building. Uh, as you can see on the left hand side, the soil under that site kind of had two different characteristics and that's actually the reason I'm standing before you today is that soil on the left hand side had a lot more clay content. Um, but the next steps were to install this uh, geotextile and then start trucking in structural fill. Those white pipes that you see sticking out of the ground are settlement monitoring markers, and we installed five of those. Those allow us to basically measure how much this site settles once the load is there. Uh, and I should note that uh, if there's any concern about uh, having these soils consolidate, uh, the elevation shrink, and then having the load removed and having it spring back into place, uh, that's not a concern. That's not how this soil is going to behave. It's not like your memory foam mattress at home. Uh, it's maybe a little, it's a, it's, a bad, it's a bad analogy, but it's maybe a little closer to us, like fresh fallen snow when you walk on that and it compresses. So you've got a bunch of voids in this soil. Uh, it was never compacted, it was just placed. And by introducing this, this extra load, we're compressing that soil and that'll give us a nice strong foundation for this new building. Moving on, this shows the, uh, the ground level coming up and at this point uh, the structural fill is in place so at the end of the day our new pavement and our new building will be at the same grade as the existing pavement and the existing buildings. However, even though we did a public outreach and attempted to let the public know uh, the reason for this preloading project, there have been questions. Why is the port building this so high? 
Uh, please rest assured that is not our new foundation. <laughs> there you go. This, this photo shows uh, the site to the south, and that is where this gravel will end up eventually. It will become the base for the uh, outdoor storage area that will be fenced in. So this material is basically uh, serving two purposes for us. It's compressing the underlying soils now, and then we'll be able to reuse it for our parking, our storage area. And uh, you can see some more of those settlement markers there and quite a bit of material. Uh, altogether, the structural fill was about 5,500 tons, and the preload was another 7,500 tons. As I mentioned earlier, we, we did have a lot of uh, interest from our local contractors on this. We had six bids, and those were pretty well clustered. So uh, we felt like it was a very strong showing, but since this is basically the hottest construction market we've seen in the last 10 years, the prices were about 20% higher than we had expected. And as Commissioner Shepard alluded to earlier, uh, that unfortunately appears to be our new reality for the time being. So um, just to be very clear, if you read Resolution 1358A, uh, it requires the small works roster projects to be estimated under 300,000. And then our own internal policy puts that cap at 250,000. We don't want to come any, anywhere close to that threshold. Uh, this project came in at 300,000, and we did award it. We did have that ratified by commission according to due process. With this change order, uh, it's going to elevate the contract to about $332,000. And again, the, the existing bylaws don't put a cap on what these contracts can be, but out of an abundance of caution, we wanted to come here to you and uh, have you act on it so that there were no questions raised by the auditors. While I'm on the topic, um, and uh, forgive me and just indulge me, uh, I'm an engineer so I kind of geek out on this stuff as you know. Uh, we have seen about an inch and a half of settlement so far in the last month. So uh, we think that that's going to approach four inches. The interesting thing is that we're going to time the building construction not on the total amount of settlement but actually tracking that chart and seeing how the rate of settlement changes and when it's safe to build. But it is uh, gratifying to see that this rapid response uh, is bearing fruit. Are there any questions from the commission? Mr. Shepard? I don't have any. Mr. Briscoe? I have one. Um, you spoke of using the, uh, the uh, preload settlement for the uh, fenced-in area. Is it going to use all of that, or will it be excess? It will use all of it. It will use all of it. Okay. Thank you. I just want to thank you for dumbing it down. <clears throat> the memory foam versus snow <laughs> analogy was, was nice for those of us. What were you ruminating on need, that? need the dumbing down. <laughs> yeah. I have nothing further. Commission ready to vote? A motion to authorize the executive director to execute change order number one to the public works contract with Faber Construction in the amount of $32,325.91 for a revised total contract amount of $332,235.56. Mr. Shepard? Aye. Mr. Briscoe? Aye. Mr. Bellas and I. Thank you. <clears throat> Action item number three. Sorry, a motion to authorize the executive director to execute an interagency agreement with the Washington State Department of Enterprise Services Energy Program to provide contract management services for renewable energy production projects, starting with a solar panel installation at the Bellingham Cruise Terminal. Good afternoon, everyone, commissioners. Uh, my name is Adrienne Hedges. I'm an environmental specialist with the Port of Bellingham. The action before you uh, for approval is the next step in the Bellingham Cruise Terminal solar panel installation. Uh, we wish to apply for a Department of Commerce grant, and they have uh, announced that the deadline for that is December 31 of this year. Um, it 
it had originally been the middle of November, but they've extended it based on feedback. Um, so that grant would provide up to 50% of the cost of the project. Um, the port does need an energy consultant uh, to assist the, with the project design. That's a twofold requirement. One, to have the best project possible, and two, in order to apply for the Department of Commerce grant. So we could uh, go this route with the Department of Enterprise Services um, interagency agreement. We could also have our normal RFP process, but as you just heard, that takes about eight weeks. And with this deadline approaching quickly, um, that is not going to work for us, unfortunately. So it's another contracting method. <laughs> Um, so this energy consultant would be hired through an interagency agreement with the Washington State Department of Enterprise Services Energy Program, which we're going to call the DES because I can't say that more than once. Uh, the DES acts as the vehicle for contracting the energy services company, which is called an ESCO. Uh, the first steps are no cost to the port and there would be no payment for the ESCO services until construction begins in 2019. So this interagency agreement would be effective until 2022 and is not limited to this project. So that could give us some time to explore other projects in addition to the cruise terminal solar installation. So we are at stage one of this slide. Um, and all of these steps, one, two, three, and four, would have to occur before the grant submittal deadline in December. So this is not a typical design and build contracting process. I would be coming back to you um, if we choose to move forward with this uh, another couple of times before we submit the grant application. We have used this process uh, in the past to evaluate and build energy efficiency priority projects uh, throughout Port Property. In 2010 and 2013, we used the same um, process with, a different, uh, with an ESCO. Uh, this interagency agreement handles the contracting, which would allow the port to choose that ESCO from the DES pre-approved list. And that DES then um, acts to review all of the proposals from the ESCOs and provides oversight to assess the reasonableness of the project design, cost, and other factors. So we have uh, an additional resource there to help us evaluate those. Once an, once an ESCO is chosen, they perform a preliminary audit at no cost to the port even if there is not a viable project. Um, this audit will determine whether the cruise terminal building is a good fit for a solar installation and will result in a proposal to move forward, including the costs of the next step. We would then come back to the commission for approval to move forward. If we choose to move ahead to step three, the DES will authorize the ESCO to perform a more detailed uh, audit which includes the energy savings and the maximum cost of the project, and those are guaranteed by the ESCO at that stage. The result of that audit is called the Energy Services Proposal, which you'll see at step three on this slide, and that again would be brought forth to you, the commission. At that point, we have the option to decide not to move ahead if the project doesn't meet our uh, criteria. And if we do move ahead, then we pay the fees for that uh, audit as part of the construction phase in 2019. Staff recommends approval. <laughs> Do you have any questions for me? I have a few questions about the grant. Mm -hmm. um, is, is this the first time this has been being offered by Commerce? No. They've offered this particular grant before? They have. It's the first time that they have managed the grant application process. So it's, uh, it's new this year. Was it in ecology in the past or? No, it was, uh, it was actually handled through, sorry, I have to look at it. It's one of the universities, Washington State University. Oh. Mm -hmm. Okay. You're nodding, Brian. Okay, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so do we think this will be a recurring grant then in the we, future? We don't know. Okay. Um, the, I do know that the amount in the grant pool has been decreasing. Um, in the past, they've had two stages, like a two-year process for awarding um, grants where they had one pool for the first year and then what, whatever was left over was awarded the next year. But this, this round, they're only doing one uh, award round. Okay. Well, this, this stage two of this um, potential for getting that preliminary evaluation, that seems like a pretty good deal. We could mm -hmm. line up a number of other projects that we are curious about 
-hmm. and get some um, some useful feedback mm -hmm. uh, for no cost there. Yeah, I, I think if we want to expand this, we definitely need to be going ahead in good faith and not expecting sure. a whole lot of <laughs> extra work for no fees. But mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah, we could okay. discuss that for sure. I don't have a question, but kind of a statement for the public so they kind of understand what we're doing here. Um, this project has the potential, and correct me if I'm wrong, anybody in the room, has the potential to, to power the uh, cruise terminal, if I'm not correct, incorrect, rather. It's not 100% of but, that power, but yes. Yeah, and also the potential to power uh, stations for electric cars to charge in that area, if I'm not incorrect. We, we could. I'm not aware of any um, plans for electric vehicle no, stations it's right a, there now. It's, a pot it's one mm -hmm. of the potentials of this. Mm -hmm. So th those are the things we're looking at to, to do, and that's why we were looking into doing this. So my question is a big bit broader. Um, I'm not convinced this is the best project at the port. Um, we've talked about maybe doing something out of the airport mm -hmm. with, with a lot of vacant land. Um, and that we don't have any evaluation on that. So we're basically picking the cruise terminal because it's got the right square footage of roof space and it's an attractive project to begin with. But we don't have any way of determining whether this is the best use of this technology as a kickoff for the port, for example. How, how do we get to that point so that we can, because at, at any level I want it to be a success mm -hmm. if we're going to do it, mm -hmm. um, and to get the most benefit from it. So where do we go to get the best location to do a project like this so that it benefits the port in a greater capacity? That's open-ended question, I know, but I'm hoping we have an answer. <laughs> or at least something to ruminate on. I'm assuming this is the start. <laughs> um, we do have, uh, I think the, uh, Working with UNESCO will definitely open up those doors for those conversations and, and uh, help us evaluate that. Um, and one of the reasons we are looking at the cruise terminal is that it's such a good story and I think a really good opportunity um, to help us with our grant application to get that grant. Is there any indication we'll get something similar to this if we identify it at a location? Yeah, I think it's, you know part of the driver of this is affordability, right? The, the bigger the project, the more capital we're going to need to, to implement it. So when we looked at this project, it fit. We could find the money to do it, and the state seemed to be interested in it. So I think that's that's a big driver of it. If we're looking at you know big solar farm out at the airport, we're going to need to find millions of dollars to do that. Yeah. It looks at the building also indicate that it is a good fit and uh, the, the roof structure itself yeah. well the roof the the pitch is good the aspect is good and the uh, you can just clamp solar panels on so you don't have to drill holes into it and it's facing nice. the right direction yeah. it's facing the right direction mm -hmm. those, those metal roofs so they're so much easier to install panels on you, know, you mm -hmm. don't have to penetrate the roof surface which bring you know just makes your your roof is going to last longer and it's easier to install so mm -hmm. there are and it has no um, interference from any trees or other buildings so it's in a perfect um, site but I, I think it's a it's a good question and I would I would love us to be able to utilize this tool or others to make a more systematic evaluation of our other properties and really be strategic about where we're investing our, our funds I think if we have a good story we're able to show success getting a grant that makes the next time we apply even easier because we already have a good story to tell. Um, and I think we have a, a number of um, useful opportunities that have very little, very few trees or other buildings blocking their um, potential to absorb sun all day long um, here, even, even on those gray days. Um, and so I'd, I'd love us to keep looking at those and, and put them into a, a private prioritization list. Mm -hmm. Any other comments? I'm good. Well, and it is going to be visible. From your, All right. Or from your office, not your house. <laughs> All right, commission, give me the vote. Motion to authorize the executive director to execute an interagency agreement with the Washington State Department of Enterprise Services Energy Program, or DES to provide contract management services for renewable energy production 
projects, starting with the solar panel installation at the Bellingham Cru Cruise Terminal. Commissioner Shepard? Aye. Commissioner Briscoe? Aye. Commissioner Bell is also an aye, so thank you. Okay, so I'd like to kind of put the stevedoring thing on to the last. If I got to stay here, you guys got to stay here. I'm kidding. Action item number four. A motion to approve a service contract between the West Coast Terminal and Stevedore Company Incorporated and the Port of Bellingham covering specific Stevedore services at the Bellingham Shipping Terminal. Thank you, Diane. Good evening, Commissioners. <clears throat> Chris Clark, Business Development Manager at the Bellingham Shipping Terminal. Sorry I'm a little bit hoarse. Um, bear with me, please. Um, the background for this action is that West Coast Terminal and Stevedore Company, the Washington State Division of Ports America, has received requests from several of their customers to provide ship unloading and loading services at the Bellingham Shipping Terminal. These customers include the break bulk ocean carrier Saga Wellco and Pacific Basin, as well as major inbound cargo shippers such as Cantac Corporation. Granting a service contract would give West Coast Terminal and Stevedore Company exclusive stevedoring rights for ocean vessel discharging and or loading of foreign and domestic origin steel products, as well as the unloading of foreign origin inbound forest products, metal and aluminum ingots, modules, oversized, and project cargoes. Not included in the exclusive contract would be foreign origin steel pipe products, except when carried on the same ship with foreign origin inbound steel, bulk cargoes, and all outbound cargoes, also known as export cargoes, such as modules and project cargoes, with the exception of domestically produced steel products previously mentioned. It should be pointed out, however, that the port warehouses and all the land in the Bellingham shipping terminal and the adjacent log pond area will remain under the sole control of the Port of Bellingham, which will set wharfage, land lease, and other tariff-related items such as storage rates. In addition, the port retains the right to load or unload the cargo on the land side, for example, into or out of trucks, rail, if and when available, at the Bellingham shipping terminal. However, the port may seek assistance from West Coast Terminal and Steve or company to perform these operations. Term of this service would be one three-year contract with two three-year extension options upon mutual agreement. As far as upkeep is concerned, please note that on or before January 31st, 2019, the port along with West Coast Terminal and Steve or companies will identify agreed upon maintenance and repair items. The port will then address these items with expenses of the port not to exceed $50,000. <clears> Thereafter, ongoing routine maintenance will be the responsibility of the port. However, if the port is unable to or unwilling to conduct such repairs in a reasonable time frame, the customer has the right to terminate the agreement with 30 days notice. The board has the right <clears throat> to invoice the operator for any damages caused by the operator, its employees, agents, or subcontractors. The port has no additional ancillary costs associated with this transaction, as the intention of West Coast Terminal and Stevedore Company is to supplement the cargo equipment owned by the port with their own equipment as need be. Lastly, Ports America would provide joint marketing opportunities to the Port of Bellingham, thus allowing the port to maximize their sales budget. As far as financial impact is concerned, we anticipate increased revenues as a result of this transaction. However, at this time, the exact scale is not known. And today we have with us um, two gentlemen from Ports America, um, Paul DeBolt and, and Bart um, Gotthard. Um, if you gentlemen could please make yourself apparent. And also, we've previously um, have had um, a statement from Darren Williams of Local 7. So, wondering if the commissioners have any questions about this, we'd be happy to answer. When this came before us, we had a few questions about the exclusivity of the contract. Do you, are you confident that we've created enough of a balance here in this, um, in this iteration to accomplish that? Well, since that previous conversation, I spoke with several of the ocean carriers about this very concept, and um, 
actually they had no objections to it at all. Um, so I think we've covered that ground I think the objection was on the port's behalf for giving exclusivity to certain commodities to Ports of America, and we did push back on some of those, and we've changed the agreement. Uh, I was one of the people that objected to giving them that exclusivity, and I'm pretty comfortable with what we have here. Uh, they do have some exclusivity on a lot of items and a lot of cargo, um, but I think they're going to perform well on that, and I think giving them that exclusivity will result in business coming into the shipping terminal that we would have otherwise not gotten. Commissioners, I might add the exclusivity is product-based, not geographically based, Correct. and it's the products that this firm said they specifically want to handle. Mm -hmm. So I, I agree that this is kind of narrowed down to a reasonable compromise between the port and then somebody who needs to go out and get a hold of these products. Okay. Good. Well, since the past exclusivity has been around no car grow, this is a major um, step forward. So thank you all for your work on this. Thank you, Commissioner. I have a comment after we vote. <laughs> it's a love-hate relationship I have with him. It really I'm ruminating on it. <laughs> um, I see it as a partnership. Um, I see that you have as much responsibility as we do to uphold our end of the bargains. Gentlemen, we'll help you market. You'll help us bring jobs to this community. Um, and I think that's um, a fair deal. And uh, three years is not an unreasonable time frame uh, to see how this works. Um, at that point, we can revisit. Uh, keep in mind, we will still all be commissioners during that time period. <laughs> so we will remember. But let's see if we can't develop a great partnership. Um, like I said, as a port commissioner, I would love to see us see how we can help you become more successful at what you do um, in addition to giving you exclusivity. So anything we can do to help is my take on that. So ready to vote or would you like to comment pre-vote? Shall we vote? A motion to approve a service contract between West Coast Terminal and Stevedore Company Incorporated and the Port of Bellingham covering specific Stevedore services at the Bellingham Shipping Terminal. Mr. Briscoe? Aye. Mr. Shepard? Aye. I am also an aye. Gentlemen, welcome to the team. My comment. I'd uh, like to thank my two fellow former commissioners, Commissioner McCauley, and Commissioner Robbins for the having the foresight to move forward with me to get this ball rolling. And I'd like to <clears throat> thank my fellow commissioners at the present time for keeping it moving. I'd like to thank Director Fricks for his perseverance to, to keep things moving along with staff. And I'd like to thank staff, and especially Chris, for his perseverance and foresight to get this put together. And I'd like to welcome Ports America to Bellingham, Washington, and I hope you're here for a long time. And I'd like to thank the ILWU for working with us. It's greatly appreciated. Yeah, you're going. Mm -hmm. So a lot of thanks there, but this is big. This is gonna be huge. You guys are dismissed. This is a major turning point for this harbor. Long time coming. Action item number five. We got work to do, guys. Get out of here. <laughs> A motion They're to authorize the executive sec or sorry, executive director to engage the law firm of Lamb and Lurch in consultation and coordination with Port General Counsel to apply for a foreign trade zone 129 designation and activation covering areas in the Bellingham Shipping Terminal and Log Pond area. Fees for the service are in the amount of 15,000 plus a 15% contingency for a total authorized amount of $17,250. Commissioners, uh, we expect that much of the inbound cargo unloaded at the Bellingham Shipping Terminal in the near future will be conveyed to Canada as its ultimate destination. In light of this, port staff has received many requests from ocean carriers and cargo interests for a foreign trade zone at the Bellingham Shipping Terminal and Log Pond area where customers can store their goods without having to pay USA import duties and taxes. The Port of Bellingham is the foreign trade zone grantee in Whatcom County, which allows it to obtain foreign trade zone designation for the Bellingham Shipping Terminal as a 
usage-driven subzone site and activate the foreign trade zone with U.S. Customs and Border Patrol. The port solicited quotes for the necessary designation and activation filings, which are the next step in, the, in this process. The most competitive proposal came from Lamb and Lurch, who are counsel to a number of grantees in Washington State, including the ports of Tacoma, Olympia, and Grace Harbor. We would like to point out that far trade zones are for-profit entities, and whoever operates the zone, whether the port of Bellingham or an outside entity, will charge fees for their services sufficient to cover costs and earn a reasonable return. Therefore, we ask commissioners to authorize the executive director to engage Liam and Lurch under the watchful eye of Port Council to proceed with the filings. Note, Port Amer Ports America has graciously agreed to pay half of the costs of this work which will total approximately $15,000. Mr. Shepard? No other comments other than it's nice to have a partner to work with here. Mr. Briscoe? I second Commissioner Shepard's comment. Ready to vote? Mr. Yes. Shepard? Oh, would you? Sure. Sorry. I'm ready to vote. ADD That's why I'm looking at ruminate. Diane. A motion to authorize the executive director to engage the law firm of Lamb and Lurch in consultation and coordination with the Port General Counsel to apply for Foreign Trade Zone 129 designation and activation covering areas in the Bellingham Shipping Terminal and Log Pond area. Fees for this service are in the amount of 15000 plus a 15% contingency for a total authorized amount of $17,250. Mr. Shepard? Aye. Mr. Briscoe? Aye. It's unanimous. Thank you, Commissioners. Now you guys can go. <laughs> Action item number six. A motion to authorize the executive director to execute a sole source contract with Heartland LLC to update the Cherry Point Industrial Development District study prepared by Heartland LLC in 1998 and to analyze the feasibility of developing a large-scale, multi-phased business industrial park that can attract new investment and jobs to Whatcom County. Good evening, Commissioners. Don Goldberg, Director of Economic Development. Um, as Diane said, I'm here to ask for uh, approval for a sole source agreement. Uh, as many of you know, I believe that uh, the Cherry Point um, industrial area is, is uh, a jewel that we are not uh, taking advantage of. For many years, there's been uh, continued arguments on whether that property should continue to be uh, a fossil fuel farm or whether it should be um, a park or other things, and I'm a true believer that we're not looking at what it might, uh, the, the possibilities uh, of that property. I, I believe very strongly that it has uh, the ability to have the most jobs within the county. Um, we are very strong partners with our uh, Canadian friends to the north. Uh, the properties up there are incredibly expensive and they have very few of them. And so it's now time to reevaluate what this property can do for us. Um, 20 years ago, Heartland was hired by the PUD and Port for approximately $250,000 to create a very in-depth study. That's 20 years ago. Um, the, the same company still does the same work. They work up here in our community often. They're based in Seattle. Uh, and many of the same people are still working at, the, uh, at Heartland. I reached out to them and explained to them what we were looking at doing. Uh, and they came back to us with what I feel is a very fair number. Uh, and also the timing associated with delivering a report. So, the, what I reached out was for them to update the entire uh, report based upon the fact that uh, many of the owners and users are different there now. Our zoning laws have changed. The county has now got a fossil fuel ban. Uh, and the fourth terminal that was going to be used as a coal terminal is no longer a priority and probably won't ever occur. 
So it's time for us to reevaluate what the best use and highest and best use is for this property. I have some ideas. I have a lot of background in this. And so uh, Heartland has come back to us with a uh, time and material not to exceed $75,000 for a complete update of the study and to expand it. So I'm here to request uh, approval for a sole source agreement to do that. I'll kick this off with my pet peeve, and that is the sole source contract. Um, it seems that enough time has passed since the 1998 review that perhaps someone else could also take this review and do the same work since most of the people who were involved in that first effort are no longer with us. Um, so it, it's not, I haven't resolved it completely in my head. I'm, I want you to tell me why Heartland is the best firm to take this from where it was to where it is, given the age of that report, um, and why it should be sole source. I think it, even though the report is aged, uh, it still holds up. And a lot of the folks at Heartland are still there. And we would be paying another firm uh, a couple hundred thousand dollars to get up to speed and understand the area and understand Cherry Point uh, versus the 75000 we're going to pay to Heartland. Uh, keep in mind, Heartland worked with us on the GP site as well uh, when we selected Harcourt Developments. So they're very familiar with our area. They're very familiar with the Port of Bellingham, how we do things. And I think the sole source is justified for that alone because we will save in paying someone else to come up to speed. And you think it would cost a couple hundred grand to get somebody else? You know, the first effort of this was a couple hundred grand, I think. 250000 in 1998. Yeah, so. But that was 98. So those, those dollars are going to be. been done, right? Yeah, but then someone else is going to have to take that report and get up to speed on it. You're going to be paying them by the hour to do that versus Heartland's already there. So, it, you know, the difference may not be a couple hundred thousand, but there's going to be significant savings by going with Heartland based on their knowledge and their historical report. I support uh, um, Director Fix's uh, comment uh, that it would take much longer for us to do this. And one of the things I want to be able to do, since this is uh, time and material, we can begin this process. The, the last comment I forgot to mention was that the PUD does want to be a partner with us, and they are planning on budgeting in 2019 up to $50,000 to put towards this study. So it would be a 50-50 up to $50,000. So since they, I cannot commit that for them because they have not gone through their approval on 2019 budgeting, uh, but I, I do have room in my budget in 18 to begin this process. So we would not have to wait until 2019 to just actually begin the bidding process and all. That, by the way, is a very persuasive argument for me. <laughs> yeah, I'd, I'd, uh, I'd say this is a time-sensitive issue. I mean, we've been paddling around in the pond here long enough with one foot going. We need to get both feet going, and this is the way to get it going. And, I agree that we don't we don't need to spend any more money uh, having someone else dig up and research what's already been done. And although there's going to be new things added, of course, but I think we've got we've got people and um, poking around, sniffing around that we could probably put in this area, and we need to have this done, you know, now, not later. So uh, that would be my argument to to not giving it you know, to so, someone else. Um, just tell me one, your office is tri-funded, so you're funded by the city, the county, and the port. Um, tell me how you, the funding for this works. Is this coming out of port funds, or is this coming out of tri-funded funds? Does the tri-funding just fund staff, or does it fund these operational costs as well? So uh, I have put a request in for our next year funding with the county to have special projects that would uh, help us out on this study as well. Uh, in, in general, uh, we put all of the economic development costs for the county, uh, the port, and a uh, portion of the city of Bellingham into one pool, and then that's my budget in which I control and, and do the services for the region. So uh, it would all be shared. So, it, it, so just like the the staff um, salaries, this is also would be considered mm -hmm. tri-funded, where all of the agencies are participating in it. 
Correct. And then we add the PUD in this particular case uh, to fund it as well. Which is a great question. So if we approve this, are they automatically or do they have to go to their bodies and get no, approval? No, because it's not approved in their 2018 budget. So they would be trying they to They would have to approve it, it as well. I believe they would have to put it in their 2019 budget. Correct the, me if the, I'm wrong. The but. 2019 budget, we've requested a special uh, a special line item for, for some special projects, this being one of them. So they would have to approve it for next year for additional funding. But in terms of our existing budget to afford uh, the process for 18, uh, we have the, the funds uh, based upon what they've paid us as well as what we have. Okay. And, and just tell me, what is this going to allow us to do that we don't already know now? Because you've got some, you've shared with me some interesting ideas for the type of build outs we could achieve out there, the type of industries that we could attract, the type of projects, and they're, they're quite diverse and, and interesting. Why don't we just move forward with those concepts without spending the 75K? Because at this point, nobody controls uh, Cherry Point. It's a conglomerate of different ownerships, many of them being international corporations. And then we have two major landowners. And nobody has uh, taken up the responsibility of master planning it, coming up with all the ideas on putting the, the project together. And so it just sits there waiting for somebody to do that. And so I've taken that on. Okay, so it's really a master planning process that sets the, the vision. It, mm -hmm. it doesn't change the land ownerships. It doesn't do any of those things, but it, it would put those a charted direction there. Yeah, because everybody is kind of sitting up back waiting, and they're not speaking to each other, and they're not coordinating the efforts and the, the vision. So as I bring this vision forward to the existing ownerships, um, as well as the PUD and other partners, including the county, everybody's been getting quite excited. Uh, an example is one of the areas that I want to put out there is a substantially large solar field, uh, one of the largest maybe that we can. And in economic development, we're we, we want to expand existing businesses, so not only can we deal with uh, green energy and, the th uh, and fossil fuel issues, but we have a um, solar manufacturer local, and we have one of the largest um, solar uh, companies that make the equipment for the panels uh, locally, and they're both very interested in this project. So, not only would we be facilitating the positive things for the business park, but we would be creating substantial new jobs within uh, companies that are here. Okay. Well, my, my last comment is, you know, in the, in the rationale for the sole source, you, you call out a number of the, the political realities, and you mention them again here. And um, as it, it seems that every, everyone at Heartland is going to be very well versed on what can and cannot go in uh, to that site. So as long as this doesn't come back with a repeat of asking for another coal terminal like they did in 1998, um, I, I think this is a, a positive direction to take. But I, they need, I'm sure that they are well apprised, as, as everyone else is, about both the political uh, realities and permitting realities of that location. Uh, they'll be working for me, so um, they'll be taking direction from us. So it, it's, um, they'll be requested to do certain things, aside from reaching out to the community and finding out. Uh, but even within here, I'm starting to move away from just calling it Cherry Point. With uh, Sometimes that has a negative connotation. And so we're starting to look at names like Whatcom County International Business Park at Cherry Point to start to differentiate what's left from the past. Okay. I'm at Chicago Bridge and Iron. Any other comments? I have none. Except a good job. Don. Truly the greatest untapped potential, so the sooner we get started. Do you still have to get buy-in from all the other uh, parties when you put the master plan together? At uh, some level, we've got to have buy-in from mm -hmm. everybody, right? Yeah, so I'm in deep talks with uh, the two owners, uh, the Fayalco family and SSA. They're both very excited about it. Um, the Celine family is very aware of what I'm doing. Uh, the brokers are now reaching out to me. Um, some of the local companies, PSE is now uh, requested that we they potentially may open their RFQ up for um, solar power to be out at Cherry Point. 
because of the transmission lines being there. So um, I don't think I'll be able to get this put together quick enough for the public. So uh, there's a lot to be done. Uh, it's probably a three year process to plan a park like this. So uh, the sooner the better. Well, nobody better than you to do it. So I'm convinced. Gentlemen, Mr. Oh. Sure. <laughs> a bad thing. You over-ruminated. A motion to authorize the executive director to execute a sole source contract with Heartland LLC to update the Cherry Point Industrial Development District Study prepared by Heartland LLC in 1998 and to analyze the feasibility of developing a large-scale multi-phase business industrial park that can attract new investment and jobs to Whatcom County. Mr. Briscoe? Aye. Mr. Shepard? Aye as well. And I think this may be a very important development, so I'm an aye as well. So thank you for your time. Thank, thank you. Thank you for spearheading this. And thank you for recognizing the opportunity that exists. And I think it's tremendous. It took vision to see that. Thank you. Okay, we have one more item, item seven. A motion to author, or to approve a harbor land lease between the Port of Bellingham and Drayton Harbor Oyster Company for premises in Blaine, Washington. Thank you, Diane. Uh, good evening, Commissioners. Um, Drayton Harbor Oyster Incorporated is owned by Steve Seymour, who is here tonight. Um, they operate out of the Blaine area um, on um, property in Drayton Harbor. They have a lease from the Department of Natural Resources in the Bay and also out of the Blaine Marina. Uh, they have uh, several vessels, uh, including an oyster barge, uh, Flupsy, which is a floating upwelling system for oyster uh, cultivation, and uh, other vessels that they use in their business, um, some of which are moored in the marina and um, some out in the bay. They've requested a lease uh, of the end pier extension in Blaine uh, to consolidate their moorage uh, for their vessel used in their aquaculture operations. Uh, the proposed lease is for approximately 2,700 square feet, mostly of the in-water area, uh, but also the outer portions of the end pier extension. Uh, the lease uh, doesn't authorize the use of the pier deck other than for um, pedestrian access. The term of the lease would be for one year with uh, um, one year automatic renewals, but could be terminated by uh, uh, both parties given a 10 day notice by the port or a 30 day notice by Drayton Harbor Oyster. Uh, the uh, lease area is in the port management agreement area with DNR, and so rent is based on uh, the requirements per state law and includes rent for uh, this as a water dependent use, uh, including some aquaculture production, and then the use of the port owned improvements. Drayton Harbor Oyster has uh, reviewed the condition of the structure and accepts the improvements in their as is, where is condition. Um, and um, the port has not made any determinations or representations about the conditions of the improvements, um, but Drayton Har Harbor Oyster has warranted uh, access uh, to the premises uh, to determine the conditions will work for them. Drayton Harbor Oyster also understands that the access is limited and that utilities, uh, specifically electricity, would have to be provided for them as the tenant. And with that, the real estate recommends approval of the lease. Okay. Uh, I'm the commissioner to ask that this be pulled from the uh, consent agenda. And it wasn't for a reason of opposition. It was for a reason of transparency with the public because this is a new lease. And um, if someone was wanting to speak to it, we would have passed it on the consent agenda with no one having the ability to speak in opposition or speak for. So uh, I, I spoke with Director Fix on uh, Friday or Friday, I believe, and we both agreed that it was a prudent thing to do just, just for, for proper protocol being followed and transparency to the public. There was no other reason other than that. Do, does this qualify as overwater coverage or is this 
separate? Uh, this would be the moorage area. Um, so I don't believe it would be overwater coverage. It's, ex it's existing. It's existing stuff in the water. Yeah, the, the the physical structures they're using are existing today. I imagine they're bringing in you know vessels, but those don't count as coverage because so, they're not permanent. Correct. Okay. I don't know about the flupsies. Do those count as coverage? Yeah, go on, please, Steve. Thank you. Uh, Steve Seymour, Drayton Harbor Oyster Company. Um, I guess the flupsy is a little bit of a question mark as far as overwater coverage. It is a basically a float. The current flups that we have is um, about 10 by f 16 feet in diameter. Uh, it has roughly, oh, maybe 20% open area. Um, I don't know. It, it's a question mark. Um, we will probably need to approach the core. Um, they would like to have their fingers in that particular pie. Um, we certainly have a 30-acre lease out on the harbor. Um, We've been farming the bay since the mid-80s. Um, yeah, there's been a lot of positive press about Drayton Harbor Oyster and all the, all the improvements in water quality and stuff. And so, you know, it's, a, it's an opportunity. Um, we're mostly interested in, we currently have a small flopsy moored in a slip. Um, it's not unusual. A lot of shellfish growers are moving towards putting flopsies in marinas. Flopsy is an intermediate stage. We, you know, we purchase what's called eyed larvae, a very small little 200 micron animal. Uh, grow it on a land-based nursery for one to two months. And when it gets to be about, oh, a millimeter or so, it's moved to the flopsy to be grown another one to six months to a size of a half at three quarter inch before it's moved out to our harbor lease. Um, so it's an intermediate stage. Um, we're interested in that pure extension site as a maybe a better place for the flepsy. You know, we are in a slip during the fishing seasons. We have, you know, transit boats come in. No one knows really what's there. 500, 600,000 small oysters, you know, valued at five or $600,000, you know, in, in two years. And so it's, it's, it makes us a little nervous, you know, and the pure extension site would be more secure at least to be removed from a lot of the boat traffic and sometimes the pollutants that arise from that. Um, we want to test the site, hence the, the year. Um, certainly the experience we have at the current site has been really, really encouraging. Uh, we get very high survival. There's magic in Drayton Harbor. I've said this before, that whole bay is a, a really unusual place as far as growing oysters. And um, uh, I think it's, it's um, well, I don't know. Anyway, this is what we're doing. Um, so I don't know. I mean, the core, when we submit, submit the permit, it'll generate some feedback. Um, they have permitted other flupsies in other places. Generally, the overwater structure issue becomes with submerged aquatic vegetation. We've already surveyed that bottom in that area. It's roughly 12 to 16 feet deep, and there is no vegetation to speak of. It's mostly just sand and silts. So that shouldn't be a huge issue. Again, we're not feeding these animals. They're basically feeding on the, the things that are in the water. So you know, we're not adding anything to the water. So they're pretty benign. Mm -hmm. um, so. Okay, and this will this is going to allow your business to expand to some capacity, or is this just a replacement well, of something we, else? Well, we are expanding. I mean, we have a little retail store up in Blaine. Uh, we're in the process of moving to a, a new site that will probably in the spring. It's an expansion. Uh, it'll also involve another tenant, um, um, potentially a fresh seafood market. Um, we have, you know, the little store is... I think some of you have probably been there, a little 300 square foot space that has become really unique for the city of Blaine. Um, it's become a destination for a lot of Canadian and, and Ferndale, Custer, Billingham customers. Um, you know, it, it honors what this community has been able to do as far as cleaning up the bay. Uh, it has that whole farm to table thing. I mean, it's just uh, really a cool, cool venture in a lot of ways. Um, so seed, I mean, we have to have seed, you know, we, we try to set half a million to a million oysters a year. 
for our farm. And, uh, and so the Flopsy is an integral part of yeah. our single oyster production. And, and uh, that's, yes. That's great. And my, my only other comment would be that I, I think because of the close proximity to public access on that pier, we've got an opportunity for some education around what's going on. It's an exciting story. It's a story that people enjoy. It's a delicious story that people are able to um, yeah. uh, participate in eating. And I think we could, we could really share with the public what's happening there because they're going to be curious. And well, it's an it's a interesting story about what's going on. It's a great story, and it's also a, an opportunity. I mean, I, you know, I'm a little visionary here. I, I think Drayton Harbor could, could grow into a, uh, a fairly significant little industry or centered around shellfish, you know, and um, we, should, uh, we should foster that. Certainly. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm ready to call for the vote for you. Yeah. Because I know where this is going. Yeah. I just want our staff to think about signage at some point, working with you and seeing yeah. where we can get some of that education happening. Okay. I have one question for Brian. I think it, Brian can answer it. Um, being it's a flopsy and it's moved around, um, that wouldn't constitute a permanent coverage over water coverage area, would it? Uh, good afternoon, Commissioners. Brian Gowan, Director of Environmental Planning Services. Um, most likely not. If it was something that could be moved around, if it's on, a, if it's a float, if it doesn't have permanent anchorage, that sort of thing. Um, I don't know the specifics of this particular facility, so I'd have to take, we'd have to take a look at it. But if it is already in a slip right now, um, yeah, that makes it makes it seem like it's something that's mobile to me. All right. So I said, so the Corps shouldn't be able to raise too much stink about that. Yeah, again, I'd have to look at it, but I, I would imagine not. Yeah. And if we if they do, I'm assuming we can assist Steve and yeah, put yeah, a little push we can definitely help out with that. Okay. Yeah. Diane? A motion to approve the harbor land lease between the Port of Bellingham and Drayton Harbor Oyster Company for premises in Blaine, Washington. Commissioner Briscoe? Aye. Commissioner Shepard? Aye. And a hearty aye. Good luck. Was that a pirate hardy or what? <laughs> and now, I put my glasses away. I'm going to announce the uh, advisory committee meeting. The Marina advisory committee is Tuesday, November 13th and December 4th, 2018, 6 p.m. in the commission chambers, which is here in the Harbor Center building. Technical airport advisory committee is Thursday, November 8th at 9.30 a.m. in the ARF conference room out at the airport on Bakerview Road. Uh, the Bellingham International Airport Advisory Committee, the BIAC, is Thursday, November 8th, 2018, at 5 p.m. in the RF Conference Room out at the airport on Bakerview Road. With that, is there any other business? I have some. Uh, of course you do. <laughs> um, a question for staff and maybe Director Fisk, Fix about our uh, the CFIS grants, because I know I think I believe we ran out this year, correct? This was or this was the last year that it was. Yeah, I think it was the last year technically, but there's talks about renewing it at some level. Um, there's uh, the county, I think, is going to kick in some of their lodging tax dollars, which they haven't done in the past to make up for the amount the city will decrease. And I don't believe the city's, this isn't definite yet, but I don't think the city's is going away. I think it's just going to decrease. Uh, the port has been asked to make up some of that difference. I have put that in our budget. And uh, I'm, I'm working with the CFEAST, I'm on the board, so we're working with CFEAST to figure out uh, how we make it break even next year. Um, the weather didn't help us this year. We lost a little bit of money, but uh, I'm pretty comfortable we'll get there. Okay. We've no, increased sponsorships, and like I said, I, I don't think the city money is completely going away. I think it's just gonna be reduced by a little bit. Okay, so that was my question, is if we were gonna participate in making sure that, uh, that it happens. We are definitely gonna make sure it happens. The other uh, question, Got kind of answered. Is John still here or did he leave? Uh, Adam's here, though. So. Here. Yeah. Um, John spoke that there, the, it was going to take all the dirt that was uh, preloading for the uh, storage area. And I would, I would ask if we have any kind of excess, Adam, that across the street from that new web house, there's a grass field there. And if we could put, if there is excess, we could put that stuff there because that would be, you know, when uh, when folks are crabbing and so on and so forth, that boat launch parking lot gets pretty jammed up and we've got fishermen that are leaving their stuff there, you know, overnight or a couple, three days or whatever. And if we could uh, use access, if we have it, in that other area for staging 
guys that want to leave their boats overnight that are currently you know, fishing the season. So that was just, I wanted to point that out. Thank you. That's all I have. On, on that note, I would just like to point out that the Sea Feast, even though it did lose money a little bit this year, it did add tremendous value to this port, oh, yeah. just like yeah. other events that might come to the waterfront <laughs> at other locations. Ow. Because it How is, am I going to ruminate? There is no one that would say that that sea feast was not a tremendous yeah, asset. Let me put my glasses. I can't hear you. Asset to this community, <laughs> and we want to see it continue. So, thank you for that. With that, I think this meeting is adjourned. Meeting is adjourned.